Good evening, everybody. So we shall start our evening session of the first day. As I understand, Andrei, correctly, uh, format of the talks proposed by organizers is 30 minutes for talk and five, about five minutes for questions. And we shall have a small technical break before the second talk. So the first talk is by Andrei Linde, Initial conditions for inflation. Okay, Andre, please. Okay, so I will share the screen and we go on. So first of all, it's a great pleasure to speak uh, at this conference right now, uh, not only because of Sakharov, but because of so many friends whom I see right now. This is an honor and pleasure. And then uh, the talk will be about initial conditions uh, for inflation and the choice of the subject is uh, kind of related to interesting fact that if you have any three person in auditorium, then for three people, usually they would share about 10 different opinions about the initial conditions. So it's a safe topic. You always find somebody who thinks the same way how you do. Uh, I should warn from the very beginning that I will not include any discussions of uh, quantum, almost no, discussions of quantum creation of the universe, eternal inflation, etc. I want to go back to basics because, uh, well, when uh, uh, I'm talking about inflation, quite often it is not clear whether uh, uh, some uh, simple things about it are understood to the full extent they should be. So let me start with very simple things first, and then it will be more complicated in the way. So first of all, uh, what inflation did uh, in comparison to the hot big bank and what are the lessons of it? Uh, in uh, the standard hot big bank universe, we assumed uh, originally that the expansion of the universe was almost adiabatic. Not exactly adiabatic, but nearly adiabatic. So the number of particles which we have right now is approximately the same as it was before. So if you have right now roughly about 10 to the 90 particles in our part of the universe only, we don't know how many in the whole universe. Then when the universe was born, it was assumed that it was maybe 10 to the 89 particles, but, well, but it's the same order of magnitude. At the Planckian time, uh, the Planckian density, uh, you can check uh, that there should be approximately one elementary particle per causal uh, part of the universe, which is a Planckian length. So one particle per Planckian box. And uh, this means that uh, at the very beginning, at the Planckian density, the universe consists of 10 to the 90 causally disconnected parts. Now, if you are a creator of the universe, you're looking around, you want to make the universe big. So at this first time, uh, only 10 to the minus 90 of the whole volume of the universe was under your causal control and everything else, well, you cannot uh, uh, even see it and do not even know whether it exists. <clears throat> the original entropy was uh, roughly speaking again equal to the mass of the to the uh, 10 to the 90 uh, the number of particles and the original mass of the universe in Planckian units was also given to this magic number 10 to the 90 because each particle had approximately Planckian energy. So uh, the first question is well now it's already the second maybe. Uh, why the universe is so big, and that is uh, related to the flatness problem. If the universe is uh, well open or uh, flat and it has uh, infinite size, then the number would be even infinite. So how is that? What is the origin of this number? Uh, on the other hand, if you are again, if you are well in this cosmic soup and only one part of the universe is available for you, what is a priori the probability that next Planck in time you will see other parts of the universe? Because you must be sure that other parts of the universe are created at the same time as your parts of the universe. And then if you just jungle with probabilities, how probable is that that without your control, somebody arranged that the nearby parts of the universe all also exist? And this is not a trivial question. For example, if the universe is closed, then it's just one simple uh, single part. If the universe is 
open or flat but compact uh, non-trivial topology like a torus it also could be the whole universe could be Planck in size so all of these questions they are quite serious and sometimes we answer these questions in inflation sometimes historically we pretended that we know the answer uh, so let's see what is going on uh, in order to avoid answering these questions or to answer them uh, it's easy to uh, start with uh, some very simple models whether they are re realistic or not we'll discuss later uh, not quite realistic, but we uh, can do something about that. So uh, let's look at the simplest uh, model with quadratic uh, potential. And let us assume that we start with a single Planck size domain, which is kind of under your control. Then if in this uh, part of the universe, potential energy density was like two times, three times greater than gradient and kinetic energy density, then the universe tends to start inflation at this stage. And because this uh, potential supports inflation uh, from whatever Planckian density, then it uh, start inflating. And after that, it becomes exponentially large. So you can easily incorporate this 10 to the 90 particles. And so uh, uh, all questions which I uh, asked uh, before, they are kind of uh, resolved except for we do not really know maybe in this part of the universe you had gradient terms uh, so large that the whole universe just immediately collapses so if the whole universe is immediately collapsed then you do not ask any questions because you cannot see such universes because they are like quantum fluctuations they emerge it and they are gone only uh, you can only see uh, universes and ask questions about the initial conditions if uh, inflation started, because if it's just plant can think, you have either lifetime 10 to the minus 33 seconds, so it's like elementary particle, or it exists and becomes huge and then everything is solved. So with the probability 50-50 or maybe 10%, you get inflationary universe, but you do not see any other uh, options. And then just a quick, uh, uh, and maybe once in this talk, uh, jump to quantum cosmology. Well, Alex Vilenkin, uh, I studied, many uh, people studied uh, approach to uh, creation of the universe from the point of view of quantum cosmology. And at least if you use a uh, tunneling wave function, then yes, it is uh, not uh, suppressed. Probability is not suppressed for creation of the universe is Planckian uh, in, uh, density, but it may be suppressed if it is sub-Planckian, though here opinions are different. And that's why I wanted to start with uh, just this simple uh, intuitive picture. If you are not in the good trajectory, then uh, you do not see such universes. But this model is uh, disfavored by Planck. So what can we do about that? And first of all, what do I mean by disfavor? Uh, OK. Uh, 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 so th this is another model. This is m squared phi squared but I just multiply it by three other terms. So it's uh, how many constants in total, m squared, a and b, three constants. How many observables do I have uh, uh, measured by Planck? It's amplitude of perturbations, ns uh, and r, so three, param uh, three parameters. So I can uh, feed all of these three parameters of Planckian data by choosing all the only three parameters, M, A, and B. And these are parameters which are required are not any pathological or anything. So you, using these parameters, I can describe everything that I, I see and still I can start inflation with the Planckian density. So no problem. However, and if you consider that to describe everything, you just need three parameters and compare it with a standard model, we're doing extremely well. But still it would be better uh, to avoid having too many parameters to describe uh, what we see and these options uh, exist. So before going into initial conditions, a quick uh, uh, discussion of what we know about uh, uh, preferable maybe models of inflation using Planck data. And here uh, uh, I will uh, reproduce uh, 
uh, one page from uh, the uh, uh, Planck uh, 2018, where they decided in the end of the experiment to summarize, to put all possible models of inflation, which they considered. Uh, and they considered the simplest models of inflation, which they liked most. So uh, with all of these models, they plotted all uh, results here. And on this graph, these uh, two lower points are famously related to Starobinsky and uh, Higgs inflation, so they're great. Uh, there are these two yellow lines which go from the top bottom and they cover all this territory here. These are alpha tractors. I will tell you about this, uh, something uh, which Renata and I uh, well, uh, invented. There is this green area here, and the green area is re uh, well related to hilltop quartic uh, model. It, this is essentially minus m uh, to the uh, phi to the force divided by some parameter. And it so happened that this area was just wrong. This was a mistake. Uh, that was a mistake for some reasons, which we described in some of the papers. This model by itself has unstable vacuum, if you, uh, it, because this uh, potential goes down like that. If uh, parameter uh, M in this model is small, then you can correct this model without damaging it, but then it predicts uh, NS, which is ruled out. If you want to e explain NS in this area, then you need to have such a parameters that the model becomes unrepairable unless you do something really, really tricky. The model becomes really, really ugly. So no relation to the original one. So this is like a historic error, which uh, well appears because one of the referees several years ago asked Planck to put this model there, uh, whatever. So it's very strange. Now. Uh, there are uh, uh, these, uh, um, uh, as I said, alpha attractors, and basically that's it. This natural inflation is somewhere here. There are some models here. Uh, there are some models which Planck, for whatever reason, did not uh, want to uh, put. And there is something else, this part of models. And when we start studying uh, these models, a period related to some of the models which we suggested a long time ago, but did not consider realistic, well, it happens that these models are actually very good. So let me summarize this in slightly more detail, putting here two other lines on the graph. So alpha attractors, which I will mention quickly right now, there are two basic models of that. These are T models, starting from Tanch and E models. Uh, just exponent here, and these E models are generalization of Starobinsky model effectively with different param values of parameters alpha. Okay, and if I study T models, it is this yellow area. If I study E models, it is this red uh, part between these two uh, curves. And as you see, these two uh, sets of models cover most of the area, or at least half of the area, which is uh, favorite by Planck data. And of course, here in the end, you do have uh, this Higgs and uh, uh, Starobinsky model, okay? And here I just mentioned that if I try to put, uh, explain here this year, year, uh, green line, then this would be a mistake. There is no model like that here. Uh, so explanation of alpha attractors briefly. Uh, what you do, you study, well, this simple model which we started with, m squared, phi squared, and then change kinetic term in, uh, 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 in, in this. Uh, do not uh, change anything, just a kinetic term. And then you may remove the singularity by just expressing everything in uh, terms of canonical field. And what happens is instead of m squared, phi squared, you have tanch potential. So the potential becomes plateau and then quadratic minimum but it's plateau, okay? So in this simple model after uh, this change, uh, experimental data um, uh, can be fit uh, very precisely, but alpha controls the value of R, which is, uh, well, tensor to scalar ratio. So it can be fit by different choice of different parameters alpha, okay? Now, this other part, other model, which I mentioned, and that is uh, deep brain or brain inflation, there were historically different types of uh, deep brain potential. And one uh, uh, compared to hilltop, hilltop was wrong because it was in this uh, shape. 
uh, uh, these models are also unbounded from below, but there are some models of this type, which are just fine. And these models emerged when we start studying uh, uh, string theory uh, a long time ago. So these models have uh, this potential and the simplest one n equal to four, and sometimes it is two. Uh, so these models uh, uh, has also a different interpretation, just like uh, alpha attractors, which appear when you take non-minimal terms here, you can obtain all family of these models if you also have uh, uh, different, uh, oh, uh, did I make a mistake? Uh, I, I, maybe I put here, uh, no, no, everything is fine, just, just like that. So if you uh, take these models, then what you find, you find the spectrum of different possibilities. These yellow and red lines are alpha attractors, and all the rest are different types of these uh, uh, D-term uh, models. And altogether, they just cover everything uh, from the Planck data except for this left corner, maybe. And uh, this covering, uh, this 10 to the minus 3 corresponding to Starobinsky and Higgs, it is somewhere here. But the models continue down and down and then can describe as small value of R as possible. And here, these lines become the vertical. So they just go the same models, continue covering uh, this part. So in uh, all of these inflation potential, however, uh, is about 10 orders of magnitude or smaller below Planckian density. And I wanted to have Planckian densities to start with, so it may look that we have a trouble. Um, so that's how you uh, answer the question. You have this alpha attractor model written here. And let's just add here, right uh, nearby, uh, this quadratic uh, inflation model. The potential in space of two variables will be like that. Here is a parabolic potential, and here is this hyperbolic tunch. And inflation happens like that. It starts at the Planckian density in parabolic potential. We roll here. Then you oscillate, rapidly uh, lose your uh, uh, kinetic energy. And then you roll down here, and then you have the second uh, uh, stage of inflation. And this is the second star, uh, part of inflation, which is responsible for experimental data. So the problem is solved. It is really uh, simple to write models like that for large field inflation. For small field inflation, well, actually, it's also possible. So that's what you do. You just, again, have quadratic inflation to start with here. This is very similar to what was in hybrid inflation. You uh, have uh, 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 inflation starting at the plant density here. Field rolls, oscillates, continue oscillating, moving here, come to the top of the potential, which may be like a new inflation, and then it rolls down here. So uh, the problem of initial conditions can be easily cured if you solved, if you allow yourself to consider two scale fields and two scalar fields is very minimal, having how many uh, scalar fields you may just imagine we have in string theory, for example. Okay, so, but what was interesting for me, and that's we have a simple and general way to solve uh, this problem of initial conditions without recourse, well, requiring having two fields. And that was very unexpected for me myself. I, I thought that if we cannot start inflation uh, well from the very beginning, then uh, what is the chance that we'll have it? Okay, so here is, I would not say that this is the theorem, but this is uh, looking like a theorem more and more once we study it, or at least there are some con uh, considerations which have been confirmed by experimental data. So the, uh, it looks like that. Suppose that initially the universe is flat or open by compact. Why not? If a uh, universe eventually becomes exponentially large, then the original memory of the shape of the universe uh, will disappear. And in fact, this was one of the first models which studied in quantum cosmology by Starobinsky and Zerdovich in uh, 84. Okay, so suppose that we have this flat or open universe and we want to discuss the classical evolution because again, it's possible to describe it in quantum cosmology, but let me do something simple. So just assume that you have originally 
uh, toroidal, for example, universe, and take it very inhomogeneous. And uh, this inhomogeneity is, uh, say, in gradients of the scale of field, the most dangerous. If it, if it is just in kinetic energy, it's a very simple. But if it is in homogeneity, it's, uh, then it's more complicated. So what happens is that if the universe begins, not inflating, but begins far away from the minimum of its inflationary potential, but nevertheless, uh, at, uh, uh, value of potential can be very sub Planckian. Okay, then uh, if it does not immediately collapse within the Planckian time, uh, so if the universe is not just a quantum fluctuation, then in this concept, in this context, in uh, this periodic universe, it continue expanding until inflation begins and makes the universe flat and homogeneous. It's not an entirely original idea. People were toying with this for quite a while. There were some papers much earlier than this one, and we uh, will uh, approach it again. And uh, the basic perspective, especially cleanly, can be explained in the example of alpha attractors or deep brain inflation. So what we have here, just intuition uh, works here well. What we have here is a potential which looks like that. So it is a plateau potential. Inflation ends here. But other than that, uh, this is essentially like a cosmological constant. It is not cosmological constant, only in one small part of the uh, phase space. So if you start at very large values of phi and why not, then you do not know that anything like that exists. So we uh, start uh, investigation of this model just with uh, investigating cosmological constant. So imagine that you have very inhomogeneous expanding, that is important, expanding universe. Uh, with the background of the cosmological constant. Guess what we live in this universe right now? Probably, if it is not dark energy, just a cosmological constant, we live in this universe, okay? And this universe contains huge inhomogeneities like galaxies, but who cares? Galaxies are taking away from each other uh, by the exponential or quasi-exponential expansion of the universe, soon to be quasi-exponential, okay? So, uh, what I mean is that if you have uh, this cosmological constant and the universe expands, energy density sitting in all inhomogeneities has a tendency to decrease like one divided by T squared because at the first stage we assume that there was no inflation. So it was normal expansion. Normal expansion density drops like uh, one, oops, one divided by T squared, but the cosmological constant does not drop. And eventually, if uh, expansion continues, then, well, in some parts of the universe, some parts of it may collapse, in homogeneities may collapse. But unless the universe collapses as a whole, it's difficult to imagine the possibility that some parts of the universe will not continue inflating when uh, the energy density of the universe will drop out. So there is uh, an intuition which suggests you in this particular scenario, I would use, I would say uh, that if the universe survives, survives not the Planckian time, but the 10 to the minus 28 seconds, if it is survives, then the density in average will be smaller than cosmological constant. And then the universe will expand exponentially in this state. And then eventually it will roll down here and this will be the end of inflation. So it looks like you have a natural initial conditions for inflation in this scenario, but there is an additional argument. And this additional argument is that if you consider a flat toroidal universe of a size, which is Planckian, which is, from my perspective, a more natural, or at least a possibility to start with, then the longest wavelength you can put on this torus is also of the order of one. Now, if the uh, universe does not start inflating, then the uh, size of the universe grows like if it is ultra relativistic, then it's square root of t, so smaller than t. And the horizon grows like t, faster. So what happened, your original perturbations, which were large, they become small as compared to T. They are not small as compared to the size of the universe, but they are small as compared to T. And in this sense, these fluctuations become ultra-relativistic and they do not want 
to uh, collapse later. The best chance to collapse is immediately when the universe was born. So all of these were just arguments. What we uh, done and the most uh, hero here is uh, uh, Will East. Uh, he made calculations using well uh, quite advanced versions of uh, well methods of GR, which were uh, used for studying of collisions of black holes. Uh, and here are the results of calculations. So the results are that you start with very inhomogeneous universe, and then this inhomogeneity quickly lead to creation of extremely inhomogeneous area, which is just a black hole. You see this black hole collapsing, but of course, black hole does not collapse here. Uh, black hole is formed, it has its own size, but the rest of the universe continue expanding. And the relative size of the black hole becomes extremely small, and then you do not see it. Moreover, if the black hole is created having Planckian size or slightly larger than that, then black hole is rapidly evaporates. And the whole universe becomes homogeneous, supported by cosmological constant, and inflation starts. Now, we studied it in several different models. We are continue uh, this study right now. Uh, and the answer uh, so far supports the idea that if you take the general large field inflation model uh, in this kind of environment, uh, toroidal universe, then inflation there uh, starts uh, very easily. So that's my last transparency, and I finished it uh, in time, I think. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. In fact, you finished earlier, so we have more time yeah. for. Oh, shall I talk more? <laughs> okay, no so, Questions, please. Ah, okay, Igor Valovich, please. Hello, Andrei. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I have the following question. Uh -huh. Which model from 50s, from 80s survived the Planck? Oh, uh, the Starobinsky model survived the Planck. Uh, and Higgs inflation also, its early versions were proposed, in fact, in the mid of 80s. They were recovered and made really good models later, but some precursors of Higgs inflation was known already in the 80s. They survived the plant. Uh, uh, well, uh, to put aside some, uh, well, uh, because in, in fact, the first uh, model with uh, this uh, plant potential with the uh, shape like hyperbolic tunch was suggested in the context of supergravity uh, by my students, uh, Alex Goncharov, and by myself in 83. But at that time, it looked too complicated, two different hyperbolic tunches, and okay, but we published it. So this model exists, and uh, it also survived. Uh, so few models survived, yes. Your stochastic model uh, is not valid. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, in uh, inflationary model m squared phi squared, or inflationary models lambda phi to the force, these models are ruled out. But if you just change the kinetic term there, they suddenly all of them uh, exist and do well. Thank you. Okay, Sergey Vernov, please. Uh, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, when you consider alpha attractor, you uh, make change uh, or, and use hyperbolic tangents. So you uh, consider that your field is a re some restriction in your value of your field. It can be more than some value. It can, uh, can go to infinity. Or yeah, in, in, in the original... Uh, field uh, space, this field space become bounded. But uh, this is an unphysical bound because when you want to go to canonical field, uh, uh, you find that the uh, field space in canonical variables is infinite. So in particular, it would take your field uh, infinite time to go from infinity, which is this boundary, to our present state. So there is no uh, problem in that respect. So there are no physical reason for this boundary. It is something. <laughs> well, uh, uh, 
Uh, I probably should uh, take a little bit more time if I need to explain how we came to uh, all of these considerations, but I should say the following. If you study, for example, Starobinsky model and try to re recover it in the more uh, modern day language, where uh, instead of R plus R squared, you have R plus scale potential like that. So you make uh, some transformations, uh, uh, transforming one set, uh, one model to another. And in uh, at some intermediate stage, you exactly get uh, uh, singular terms like that. But then they disappear after you finish your calculations. If you study Higgs inflation, you start with the uh, theory where you have non-minimal interaction with gravity, you make some transformation, and then at the intermediate stage, you have singular terms like that. And then you get rid of them in the end of the calculation. So what we did, uh, well, I just let's start with these terms if they uh, one way or another appear in both of the models. And in fact, this is not so unnatural because these kinetic terms, they appear quite often in supergravity when you uh, write terms using uh, Keller, kinetic terms using Keller potential like log of Z plus Z bar or something like that. And then uh, these terms automatically appear uh, from the theory which, uh, well, people uh, really like in supergravity. So there are many different ways to obtain terms like that. Thank you. The next question from Sravan Kumar, please. Mm. Uh, hello, Andre. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting okay. talk. Uh, my question is actually a bit of extension of Igor Valovich's question. Uh, I, actually, there is a lot of degeneracy in the inflationary models. Uh, for example, if you take alpha attractors, uh, uh, in your version of supergravity, and there is also no scale supergravity models which mm -hmm. predicts the same variation of tensor to scalar ratio. And also in, in the one uh, in the previous session, we had talks of Higgs inflation in Palatini formalism using torsion. So all of them predict the some different values of tensor to scalar ratio. The problem is how to distinguish all these. Uh, so what are your ideas to really distinguish okay. these models? Okay, uh, I should then go slightly back to. Uh, the pictures which I've shown here. So these, uh, talking about degeneracy, there are several different models and some of them cover uh, the same areas in uh, the uh, Planck picture. Some of them, uh, uh, some parts of the area are not covered in uh, different models like that, but there are some other models which will cover this area. So there are, uh, no, no, well, uh, first part of, of the answer is that we are right now uh, somewhere at this level. We are at the very, very top of the picture, okay? Uh, during uh, uh, several, well, maybe two decades, we hope to come closer to this part. Uh, maybe to this part, I do not know. People are maybe overly optimistic. But then this will pick up some of these models. For example, it, it may happen that uh, gravitational waves will be discovered already at the level R about 10 to the minus one. Uh, what did I say? Uh, 10 to the minus two. And then uh, we will know uh, that we live uh, maybe here but uh, maybe here, but we live not here. So we'll uh, uh, remove some of the models out of the consideration. Another important thing is that accuracy with which we measure NS is growing and we are promised that it will be two, maybe, but at least two times better in the future. And two times better will surely will distinguish models like that uh, and the models like that. So it does not mean that we will know everything about these models, but we know something. And if we have a bunch of models which describe successfully the same data, then we'll see, okay, so that's what we have. We probably can have many generalization of standard model of elementary particles describing the same data. We hope that there will be some well, consistent expansion of standard model. It's difficult to construct them. But uh, it's great to have several models which describe what you see on the sky and then none. Okay. Okay, the next question is from David Raka, please. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. 
Uh, I was curious about the part on the erasing of initial inhomogeneities. So you were saying that uh, you, you assume that you have a potential which is very flat in the region that you start looking at. I was curious mm -hmm. to understand where it comes from, where, where this assumption is used or it is useful. And another question is whether you're uh, using at some point in some way uh, some assumption about the measure favoring uh, the physical volumes, so measuring physical space rather than moving space. Well, uh, all uh, uh, right questions, and I do not have uh, much uh, to offer as an answer. What I'm doing, what we know that if we go to, say, eternal inflation scenario, then there are a bunch of different measures and different measures have different predictions. What I was trying to show is that if somebody tells you that it's difficult to construct the universe, let him put, uh, well, prove the point. Because these models, which uh, I, uh, well, uh, have shown you, they are pretty simple. And in these models, if you make assumptions, which I made, then you have inflation. Uh, so that is the maximal thing which I can say right now. I uh, think that quantum cosmology uh, one or another type should be uh, the guiding uh, uh, light for us, but quantum cosmology is a complicated science and many people have very strongly different opinions. That's why I preferred not to uh, start this discussion from that. I wanted to check that at least in the simple language, if you have simple model which pass all tests. Alex Williams, please. Okay, uh, uh, Andrei, uh, you say that minus five to the fourth model is ruled out. I just want to check, is uh, Coleman-Weinberg potential ruled out okay. as well? Okay, uh, uh, I, will, I should explain here. So this, uh, yeah, I did not prepare these slides, but uh, I can refer you uh, to the paper which it explained, uh, explained just a moment. So uh, this set of papers here, in uh, these papers we uh, studied what happens, but I will just tell you the result. The result is this, uh, maybe, uh, maybe the next it will be seen better. See these uh, green lines. Okay, if I study models with, which are called small field model, okay? If you have a small field model where you have minus, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, one minus five to the fourth, like in Coleman and Deluce, and it ends here. These models can be good, but the spectrum, their predictions will be different. If you have phi to the fourth divided by small value of m to the fourth, so in this place, you have a small value. So then kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking happens at sub planking values. Then you can change the shape of the potential without uh, changing the inflationary predictions. But they will predict your NS about 10, 0 0.94, 0 0.95 ruled out. If, however, you take literally this uh, phi to the fourth divided by m to the fourth, where m is super Planckian, and that is required to describe this area. They required uh, the field at this time to, to be about 10 to 20 to describe this area. Then what happens in these models, you cannot avoid singularity, you cannot avoid collapse of the universe unless you do something at this point place where phi crosses the minimum. And when you try to modify model, uh, to well to uh, uh, have the same prediction, but not to have a singularity. You must modify a model in absolutely dramatic way. Like instead of having phi to the force divided by m to the force, you must take one minus phi to the force divided by m to the force in absolute value of that. So kind of discontinuity or very sharp something. So you need to introduce extra parameters. So you can save if you really, really want it. You can make drastic changes to original model and save it, but it is not the beauty with one parameter model which explains everything. <laughs> Just to explain one interesting thing. Here, this part of the graph, these are predictions of a linear model, 
phi, potential phi. How is this? The, the prediction of m to the force divided by, uh, 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 sorry, phi to the force divided by m to the force. How is that the prediction of this model coincide in, the, uh, uh, in this limit, coincide with the linear model? And the answer is that uh, in the limit of m going to well, very large values like greater than 10 Planck, this line crosses zero, zero potential being linear. So when you look at this line, it is like a linear inflation. And that is why the prediction of this inflation looks like a linear function here. This is a prediction of a linear function. Okay, so this is just the artifact. And if you continue this linear, then the universe collapses. If you want to save it, you bend it and make it quadratic. But then instead of this point, you get this point. So once you start saving the model, the whole curve changes and it ends at the prediction of a quadratic inflation, not of the linear one. So it's really very, very strong change, change uh, unless you are doing something really well, like this absolute value of the potential, which is totally non-motivated. So uh, Andre, uh, what I was asking was about Coleman-Weinberg, which differs from phi to the fourth just by logarithm factor. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems that it doesn't do much. I just wanted to make sure because Shafi was arguing that uh, this model does well. well okay, uh, uh, Alex, the best answer would be to present the results of the calculations be because we studied uh, this model in our paper with Renato, one of these reference, which I gave you. I do not uh, right now remember which one is which, but I probably this is uh, this paper. Just check there because we studied the predictions of Coleman Weinberg and of many others model before we made this statement. And then we sent our, uh, so uh, check uh, what, what we say there. It, it is okay model in general, Coleman Weinberg. It does not predict these two green lines. These two green lines are wrong. There are some models which are okay, but these two green lines, this whole area because, uh, because it, this is what is written here. This is a model. So you cannot easily save this part of the scenario. You can save it here, which is ruled out. Or you can modify it with the logs. So it will be a Kolmlinberg model. So look at this paper. OK. OK, the last question by Alexander Wickman. Uh, Andre, uh, great to see you. And uh, thanks a lot for your talk. I just have a question. So if we think about uh, producing this initial bagel from a Planckian form, uh, and we believe in string theory with many other dimensions, is, it, is there any preference built for three-dimensional bagels or let's say five-dimensional, two-dimensional? How do we know that exactly our space should inflate? Okay, that's, uh, that's a very good uh, question. And the answer to this very appropriately goes back to the paper of Sakharov of 84. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 I visited Sakharov in Gorky and I told him about this multiverse story, etc. And we discussed also these different compactifications. And he came <clears throat> with a uh, paper uh, where he said, okay, so let's consider multidimensional space. In multidimensional space, you have many different uh, uh, ways for space uh, dimensions to compactify. So we have probably combinatorially huge uh, uh, variety of different compactifications. Some of them can be uh, three-dimensional space one time, some of them may have well, multidimensional compactification, but according to the uh, Ehrenfest of 1917, we can live only in three-dimensional space because in uh, four-dimensional space, five-dimensional space, planetary systems would be unstable. In two-dimensional, one-dimensional space, there is no gravitational attraction at all between uh, far-removed bodies. So mm -hmm. we do not don't have any chance. Mm -hmm. So it's in a sense it's it's an entropic uh, reasoning. 
Yeah, uh, actually, I discussed this in one of uh, the early uh, this option in one of the early papers on uh, uh, inflation, and I remember how uh, it will take one minute. I remember how I was in Leiden University, and there at every uh, well uh, every corner uh, there were some portraits of Ehrenfest and they were showing everybody the house of the Ehrenfest and his tragic fate and discussing and everybody. Nobody there knew that he uh, explained why our universe is three-dimensional. Wow, wow. Thanks. Okay. Great Thanks to see you. Everybody for questions. So thank you very much, Andrei.